I know it's in this this format here. I like this format because I, I have more control. Uh, I'll make it bigger if you can't see something though. Okay, so our learning goals today, we're going to talk about financial markets, financial institutions, and how financial managers rely on them, the function of financial institutions and markets, the difference between capital markets and money markets, um, the root causes and effects of the 2008 financial crisis and recession, uh, the changes in the regulations and regulatory bodies of the markets, and business taxes, that's a big uh, function of this class is there going to be the business taxes, the corporate taxes that we're going to do a handout on and talk about later. Now, a big class of mine, uh, pretty much for finance concentration people, is the investments class. And I cover this a lot more extensively in that, that course. Is anybody here going to be a finance concentration person? Okay, a few people here. One, only one person in this section? Two people. And most people, I'm going to be teaching more to you guys, I guess, since another person. All right. I'm just kidding. I'll teach everybody. But uh, that's a class you want to take. And all these, these topics get covered more extensively in that class. Okay. Financial institutions and markets. In the Zoom simulation, you're going to have to access the financial institutions and markets to issue stock, issue long-term debt, and issue short-term debt. That's how it ties into this lecture. So when you get to the finance page of the simulation, you may find that you have a big deficit and it won't let you end the, simu end the round or complete the round. Maybe you came across this in practice. It means you spent too much money. So your finance manager on the team, which is you, and everyone in your team is a finance manager, you have to go in and try to issue some stock, long-term debt and short-term debt. Um, and you do this. Let me see if I it's still have that. Oh, good, still open. So here is where you would issue. Uh, if you wound up here, actually you have a, a surplus. But if you had a deficit, you would issue additional shares of additional funds here. See the interest rate? This will change if you if you start exceeding uh, a, borrowing too much. These interest rates will go up, and as you pay it off, the interest rates will go down. But this is basically. Uh, uh, Long-term capital debt, short-term, and stock equity you can issue in the simulation to raise funds to manage your company. Because in the beginning, you're a young company, you don't have a lot of money, you're going to have to access the capital markets um, through financial institutions, uh, directly through financial markets, or through private placements. You can't do private placements in the simulation, but you can issue stock, long-term bonds, and short-term notes to borrow money, to finance the the expansion or investment in your company. And in the beginning of the simulation, you will be borrowing money to invest in your company, and as you get to later rounds, you'll be making enough money, have a big enough cash surplus, that you can start paying down, buying back stock and paying down that debt. So financial managers are very closely connected and tied to the financial markets and institutions because companies need a lot of money to expand. And the reason is, say you have a good idea for a restaurant like Shake Shack. Now, if you were to expand Shake Shack just at the rate of money Shake Shack has or could borrow or has a net income, they may be able to open one or two stores a year. But since they're able to access the IPO market and issue stock and go public, they're able to open, you know, uh, uh, 10, 20, 30 restaurants in a year because they have a, a whole bunch of additional cash flow that came in by accessing the financial markets, either through loans or stock or a combination. Most companies do a combination of both. And if you don't expand when the expansion is a, is a good timing for the company, someone else will come in and fill that niche. So if you're not, it, so for example, Chipotle Mexican Grill was very, um, over the last 10 years, expanded from say 19 restaurants to 1900 restaurants. And they did that through accessing the capital markets. And if they didn't do that, then a company like Carbo Fresh maybe would have come up and filled the void and opened up 1900 um, burrito style restaurants nationwide because this nation is very hungry for burritos and someone has to be there to fill that burrito demand hopefully without E. coli okay so financial institutions they act as intermediaries so basically they are the ones there are sort of three groups that we're talking about individuals businesses and governments so the financial institutions 
and the markets are the ones that are going to facilitate the movement of money between these groups of people, individuals, businesses, and government. Now, we all know that governments borrow a lot of money. What is our national, what's the, do you know the difference between the national debt and the deficit? Are they the same thing or different things? I believe you know. Right, so the national debt is what we totally owe, and the deficit is what, how uh, short, the money we're short for the year. So the deficit is smaller than the national debt. So the national debt's in trillions, and the deficit, the annual deficit's in billions. Okay, but the, the point of that little story is that the government needs to borrow a lot of money, so they issue treasury bills. And then all sorts of peoples and other governments in, uh, invest in treasury bills and give the U.S. government money, which they then spend on defense and social security and um, whatnot. Okay, so the key suppliers of funds are the individuals. So businesses and governments borrow money. Individuals, like you and me, we're the ones who save the money. And since there's a lot more individuals and businesses, all our savings gets added up and we invest it in businesses and the government for a return. So we're going to be the net supplier of funds, and the government and businesses will be the net demander of funds. All right. So now you're used to a, a local bank, uh, which you can kind of think of that also as a commercial bank. So you, you walk down the street and you see Chase. Here's an example of a commercial bank. So here's a bank that's set up to provide savers a place to save their money, and it can offer loans to individuals and businesses. Now, an investment bank is completely different than a commercial bank. Uh, and let me just state for the record, I myself have no bank account. I do not have a bank account. <laughs> no bank account. This is very simple how I do it. I have a credit union account. So a credit union account is not a bank. A credit union is not for profit. So all the money, a lot of the money that they make, they give it to me as extra interest. I've never paid a dime for ATM charges, late fees, uh, out of balance uh, fees. I don't think I've ever paid that bank anything. In fact, when I use a, another ATM, like a Chase ATM, they give me that money back the next month, up to $6. So that's why I like a credit union, because they don't take any money from me. Because we're, I'm a member and an owner of the credit union, having an account there, and it's meant to service me. Although a bank, is just, a commercial bank, is meant to profit off of you. So my whole existence as a commercial bank is you're the customer I need to get money from. So I need to make money from you any way I can. If I need to trick you, I'll trick you. Um, which they, a lot of banks had this thing where if your checking account ran out of money and you charged a pack of gum, $35 fee. Then you got gas, $35 fee. Then you went and got a coffee, $30, $5 fee. They wouldn't tell you. You could do buy 10 things before you found out that you have $350 worth of fees on your account as a bank. Obama passed a law to prevent that from happening in the future. Do you know what credit union is? Credit union is a financial institution. No, no, no. Right. The one you're, um... Oh, uh, Teachers Federal Credit Union. Okay. They're all fine. Federal mm -hmm. Teachers Union or Federal Credit Union or whatever you want to call them. They're, they're pretty much the same. but they're. Um, and the great thing about these institutions is they, they generally don't have the... Um, the risks associated with a regular bank. If you ever had a Washington Mutual account, you don't anymore because that went bankrupt. Because commercial banks take more risks because they, they make more riskier loans because they're more desperate for profit to please their shareholders to raise their stock price. Because banks generally are public companies and they have to maximize profits to please shareholders. And that means they got to fleece their customers as much as possible. Now, investment banks are something completely different. An investment bank doesn't deal with deposits from little people. Investment bank is an organization that assists in raising capital, mostly for businesses. So they advise big companies and firms um, on major transactions, such as mergers and acquisitions, financial restructuring, initial public offerings, things of that nature. Uh, financial management of companies. So investment banks are really a service companies. And they engage in... Um, trading and other market activities that their clients would need, like an IPO or 
even facilitating a private placement or secondary offering. So investment banks are really, um, they don't take deposits from savers, but they work with businesses to um, help to financially manage large businesses. Now, there was this act called the Glass-Steagall Act that passed in Congress in 1933. In 1929, we had the stock market crash and the Great Depression, and, and Congress figured out that the banks were to blame. The banks and the stock markets and the investment banks, they're all one company that was big and failed and sent us into a depression. So they passed this law saying that, you know what? We have to create a separate activities between commercial and investment banks. We have to separate their activities, commercial banks for individuals, investment banks for businesses, and that's going to keep everybody safe. And you know what? It worked. And then in 1999, they repealed it and said, we don't need this anymore. This is BS. Get rid of it. Causing, you know, we could make more money as a country without it. So they got rid of it. And what happened? Eight years late, nine years later, the Great Recession. So maybe not such a good idea. Now we have another banking entity that sounds kind of cool. It's a shadow banking system. So we have the regular banking system and the investment banks, and then we have a shadow banking system. And these are groups of other companies that lend money that you wouldn't think were lending money. So they're not traditional banks. They don't accept deposits, but they still, um, they're really not subject to the same regulations as traditional banks, and that's why they can do crazy things like collateralized debt obligations and securitization uh, and leverage and hedge positions that that will eventually cause a great recession. Okay, so let's let's talk about the banking industry, the consolidation in the banking industry for a long period of time. Most banks were just small regional chains of 10 to 13 branches, maybe 20 branches limited to one county, maybe one state. And over the course of history, these banks consolidated down to a big few. You have your Chase, your Bank of America, your Citibank. Um, I guess those are like some of the biggest. Um, according to the FDIC, the number of commercial banks uh, declined from 11,463 in 1992 to 6,000 in 2013. So a decline of 47% of these regional banks. Um, so a lot of these small community banks were uh, sucked up. Washington Mutual did a lot of this. So Washington Mutual went around and they purchased a lot of different... So Washington Mutual bought up a lot of these small, small banks. They took on so much debt, it's one of the reasons that they collapsed and were later uh, acquired by Chase. Okay. So financial markets are sort of a forum where suppliers of funds get together with demanders of funds and they interact, transact business. Think of the stock market as an example. So marketable securities are created and they take place inside of these financial markets where basically instruments are created like stocks and bonds and then transfer of money can go between the demanders to supplier, suppliers to the demanders. We also have, outside of the financial markets, we have a private placement um, I don't want to say um, group, but private placement activity facilitated through investment banks. So basically some very rich person will say, hey, I want to buy 10% of this company that's private. And they'll, they'll give them X amount of money to buy 10% of the company. Sort of like that show Shark Tank. Have you seen Shark Tank when they say, I'll give you 500000 for 10% of your company. Oh, no, I'll give you 600000 for 12% of your company. And they figure who they want the private placement from, for any of those, you know, big money people on that show. Uh, and then, of course, there's public offerings of securities, like an IPO or, or our initial offering of a bond. And there's two types of markets, the primary and the secondary. So the primary market, think of it like this. When you buy a new textbook from the textbook store, a brand new shrink rack textbook, the textbook company publisher makes money when you buy that new textbook. Then when you go to sell that textbook as a used book on eBay or Half.com or back to the bookstore and that book gets sold again to somebody else, the, the book publisher doesn't make any more money. They only make money the first time they sell it, not the second, third, or fourth time it's resold as a used book. It's one of the reasons textbooks are so expensive because they only get to sell them once. 
he and the book stays around and is resold multiple times and the publisher doesn't get any benefit from that so if if the if the university bookstores would agree not to resell books they could probably price these books similar to what you could buy them at, at Barnes and Noble you know so instead of paying two hundred dollars for an accounting book it could be thirty nine dollars but because of the resale market they crank up the price of the original book to compensate them for not re not being able to resell it. And then on your side, you resell a book, you make some of that money back. Uh, but now new financial models have, have occurred to the bookstore. The bookstore now rents textbooks as a different financial model. You can rent a textbook. And publishers now sell ebooks. So even these are being financial means of the way you buy and manage your textbooks are changing. So that's just sort of an example of a primary secondary market. In the financial market, the primary market is when the security is first born. The stock IPO or the bond is first created and sold is the primary market. Then when it's resold from one investor to another, it's in the secondary market. Okay. Here's a little chart on how the flow of funds occur. Now, private placement sort of direct directly links up demanders to suppliers of funds, bypassing financial institutions and financial markets. But generally, financial institutions collect money from suppliers and use the financial, and then take that money, bring it to the financial markets, and the financial markets brings it to the demanders of funds. So that would be sort of an IPO. So you would um, buy initial public offering, uh, and the financial institution would bring that IPO to the financial markets, and, and the financial markets would transfer the money to the demander of funds. But you can see from all these arrows, Funds can flow in many different routes, from suppliers to demanders, utilizing, uh, bypassing or utilizing either the, the financial institutions, private placement, or financial markets, depending on the particular transaction. Money market is something you might be familiar with, because a lot of commercial banks will offer a money market. And it pays, instead of paying... 0% interest, like most savings accounts these days, these money markets may pay 0.25 or 0.35% of interest. It's very low, but it's more than zero. And how these money markets do that is they put your money in short-term marketable securities, which could be very short-term treasury bills, bills or short-term treasuries, bonds or long-term treasuries, um, short-term commercial paper, uh, certificates of deposit or investing the money in other financial institutions for short periods of time. So they take a very low risk, short period of time to earn a little bit of extra interest. So that way as a saver, you can put your money in a money market and get a little bit more interest in the savings account. And then a checking account, most checking accounts definitely don't pay interest. In fact, they may actually charge you fees for the checking account. They have a money market. Um, U.S. money markets in the euro currency market. So in the euro, there's a, the sort of the next biggest currency would be the euro. So there is a demand for money market um, like securities denominated um, in U.S. dollars that could be marketable in other currencies. So it's really just sort of um, if you wanted to have your money in a marketable um, account, that is in dollars, but controlled outside the United States, you could create these euro, you could join this euro currency market. They're not for citizens of the United States. So say you're Russia or Iran, and you don't want to put money into American banking system and the market of securities in American banks. But you can put your money, but you want to have your money in dollars because it's the best currency because it's a big hedge for inflation. They can use these euro currency markets to put their money in dollars in a European market that's outside of U.S. control. So if sanctions are placed on you, the U.S. can't affect them. So that would be one reason for it. The capital markets are for long-term securities. So bonds, common stock, and preferred stock. Bonds are pretty simple. Basically, you lend a company money, and they pay you interest, and then they give you the money back after, say, 10 to 30 years. Give $1,000 to a company, they'll give you interest every year. At the end of that bond's life, they give you that money back. Uh, a stock is, you're getting ownership in a comp company. So you buy a share of stock, 
That company never returns that money, but you have a, a share of ownership of that company that you can transfer to anybody else. So if the stock price goes up, then you get what's called capital gains. Preferred stock is a stock that has a defined dividend. That's why it's preferred, because it has a stated and defined dividend, so it's better than a common share of stock, which may or may not have a dividend, and has no promise to pay dividends in the future. Uh, this is an example of a bond. I don't really need to go into that. Now, there are two different markets. There are broker markets and dealer markets. The broker markets and dealer markets are pretty similar, but a broker market, securities are exchanged with uh, two sides of a transaction, the buyer and the seller. So in a broker market, like say New York Stock Exchange is a broker market, and they'll have a facilitator just to bring the buyer and seller together so someone can sell the stock and someone can buy the stock. And it's pretty straightforward. A dealer market is different in the fact that somebody's going to make the market. Think of a dealer as someone who has a store with inventory. So in the dealer market, the dealer keeps inventory of the stock and waits for someone to come and want to buy it. And then they sell them out of their inventory. Or if someone wants to sell their stock, they can buy that stock. Even though they don't have a buyer on the other side, they can be the market maker, can buy the stock, put it in the inventory, and then wait for someone to come and want to buy it from them. So they actually, um, the dealer is creating a store of securities and then uh, will buy, will trade them as people want to buy and sell. And they take more risk because if you're holding the inventory, the stock price changes and the stock price goes down and you're holding inventory as, as, a, as a dealer market, you could lose money. But the compensation you get for being a dealer, there's a bid and ask on the stock or a spread. So a stock on the ask, it's five dollars, and the bid will say it's four fifty. So what this means is, if you want to buy the stock as an individual, you're paying the ask price, the five dollars. And when you want to sell it, you're selling at the bid, four fifty. So if the ask is five and the bid is four fifty, and you want to buy and sell the stock it's in the say in like a minute of each other, you're going to be buying at five and selling at four fifty. What happens to that fifty cents you lost? The dealer gets it. The market maker gets it. So he's making a profit for every time he buys and sells stock, and that's supposed to help supplement the risk of carrying an inventory and creating an inventory. So the, the, the dealer markets deal with a lot of smaller stocks that don't have as much volume, and that's why they have to keep an inventory. Where, we go back. I think I deleted the slide. There we go. Undo. All right, so I wanted to go back. So the broker, generally those are large, very popular stocks. And New York Stock Exchange they have a lot of volume, so they can instantly buy, connect buyers and sellers together. The dealer market on the over-the-counter is, a, much, is a, a stock market for smaller, more unknown stocks. And that's why they often have to hold an inventory to be able to satisfy people who want to buy and sell the stock because the timing isn't so exact. All right. Okay, so the NYSC, the New York Stock Exchange, also they own the Euronext, which is a European stock exchange. They're the largest stock exchange in the world, and they're worth about $14 trillion in the U.S. and $2 trillion in Europe as far as the total value of the stocks within the exchange. And the NASDAQ would be the second at 4.6 trillion, Tokyo at 3.5 trillion, and um, London at 3.3 trillion. And this is as of 2002. By, so by 2015, these are all much larger than, than those numbers because the stocks have gone up probably about 50 to 100 percent since 2002. So add a few, few more trillions to those numbers. But basically, 14 trillion, 21 trillion, still a number we can't fathom or comprehend or spend, right? It would take you several lifetimes to spend 14 trillion dollars, unless you just buy a country, you know, buy France. Is it for sale? Probably not. Okay, international capital markets is why I mentioned France, because we're going international now. 
and there is the euro bond market, which issues uh, bonds denominated in dollars, but to sell to investors outside the United States. Because remember, dollar is the dominant currency. So a lot of other people in other countries want to trade in dollars or buy or invest in dollars. There are whole countries that took their currency and said, our currency is total crap and just threw it away and said, our currency is now the United States dollar, like Ecuador, Panama, El Salvador. Thank you. These are all countries that have the dollar as their official currency and they threw out their old currency because it was just garbage uh, because of inflation. You know, um, so we have a foreign bond, mar bond market that can deal with foreign corporations or governments, of course, and we have international equity markets. Most countries will have their own stock exchange. Even very small countries like Egypt will have their own stock exchange. Iraq has their own stock exchange. Uh, but you really only hear about the rather bigger countries like China, India, um, and England, Japan, their stock exchanges, because they actually have significant value on them. Okay, so from a, from a company's perspective, the role of these capital markets is to provide you liquidity for your firm so you can obtain uh, valuable resources, external uh, financing to get resources. So if you're in a Zoom simulation, that's your company that you're the president of, CFO of, you need to use the capital markets so you could buy new factories, so you could buy equipment for your company, so you could buy, uh, have enough money to build inventory. So the role of the capital markets is to be an efficient market that moves money between suppliers to demanders um, so they can invest in these different opportunities that will grow, hopefully grow and make companies profitable. So if it's an efficient market, it's going to do this um, in a very cost-effective manner as far as the competition among investors to spenders. And the idea is, you know, if you have a significant amount of money, you want to invest it and make a better return than 0.25% in the bank. So investing in stocks or bonds or private companies is a way to do that. And the financial markets want to move that money to these companies that want to expand. And that's a good thing for all of us because expanding companies create jobs. And jobs hire college students, or companies hire, create jobs, and they hire college students to fill them. Okay. Now, behavioral finance is a form of psychology that looks at people's behavior in relationship to finance and investing. And if we look at the change in stock prices, that's one effect of people's behavior. So in the 1990s, people thought internet stocks were very, very valuable, more valuable than they actually were. So they created a bubble in internet stocks that blew up in 2000. People in housing created a bubble in housing and they thought suddenly houses that were 150,000 were $500,000 within eight years created this housing bubble. So people can act irrationally when buying assets and drive prices up. And that's all tied into the psychology of the financial markets. So sometimes the actual prices in the financial markets don't have a true connection to reality. They're overpriced. You know? So those prices eventually come down. Let's move on to ethics in um, financial markets. A big problem in the financial markets is unethical behavior in insider trading, in, in fraud, uh, in auditing, um, improper auditing, and that this leads to investors losing money because they're investing in companies that they think are more valuable than they actually are because they're being misrepresented through, un through uh, unethical behavior. And certain individuals who have the in um, proprietary knowledge or information who are not supposed to share it in an unfair, unfair manner, if they do share it in an unfair manner and take advantage of information before it's publicly released, that's insider trading. And these are all things that create uh, trouble for the financial markets and unfair conditions for uh, people who save and invest money. Okay. Let's just talk a little bit more about the financial crisis and financial institutions in the real estate. There's this movie out called The Big Short. 
does good, a good job and a much more entertaining job than I could do in explaining the story. But basically, securitization is at the heart of this story. So securitization is taking many loans and packaging them together and reselling them to investors and claiming that there's reduced risk because you're not investing in one mortgage, you're investing in a thousand mortgages. So there's a reduced risk, so there should be a lower rate of return. And what, what was good about this is that it brought a lot more money into the mortgage market, which refinanced uh, the banks and mortgage brokers to lend out more money to people to get houses. But the problem is that the people creating the mortgages were not financially responsible for them being paid back. So if you're a mortgage broker or a bank, you'd create a mortgage, you'd sell and create a mortgage, and then you would sell it up, you'd securitize it and sell it into a mortgage-backed security, which is groups of mortgages that are um, groups of loans are backed by their mortgages and those are sold to investors. So now the mortgage broker or the bank are no longer responsible for the loan, but they're the ones creating the loans. So now you're a bank and you suddenly realize, huh, I'm not on the hook. If they default on the mortgage, I'm not losing any money because I'm selling this mortgage right after I create it to make my, my fees and profits. So it would be in my best interest to write mortgages to as many people as possible, since I have unlimited amount of money now through the securitization process, I'm going to start writing mortgages for people who have no jobs, have no credit history, have bad FICO scores. Um, in some cases, people's pets got mortgages. Because I'm not responsible, I don't care. I don't. Have to, I don't have to. You know, I'm not losing money if they don't pay the mortgage. So let's create all these crazy mortgages with zero zero percent interest. Um, reduced uh, re first three years or reduced cost of the mortgage where they actually you know make the mortgage a thousand dollars a month for the first three years because they're actually you're only paying part of the principal and no interests and then we'll tack it on later when we, when we reevaluate the mortgage rescales in three years and you go from three thousand to five thousand a month as your new mortgage which you never figured out you didn't read the fine print and they didn't bother telling you so when these things all did reset and no one could pay their mortgages, that cascaded into a bunch of failed mortgages, which wound up bringing real estate prices down, which put a lot more people underwater, and then they their, their mortgages went bust as well. Because it used to be, the problem is, if you got a house and a mortgage, right? Say you got a house and a mortgage, and then you could survive for about two years, and then you couldn't pay your mortgage anymore. It wouldn't be a problem, though. You know why? Because your house you bought for 200000 is now worth 300000 so all you have to do is sell the house, and then you make a fifty, sixty thousand dollar profit for yourself, and pay back the bank what you owe. Problem solved. And that's what kept happening. People who couldn't pay these mortgages would just sell their house for a higher amount of money, and then they'd be out of hot water and even make a profit. So then people say, "Well, this is great. Let me buy two or three houses and do that." And by the time the housing market collapsed, people had three, four, five, six, seven, ten houses that they were in the middle of flipping. That now that no one's buying and prices are going down, they're going to lose all ten homes. So this compounded and created, resulted in the Great Recession that these mortgage-backed securities, people originally found out these mortgage-backed securities were full of crap, and then they started shorting them. Hence the title of the movie, The Big Short. They created um, instruments that would make money if these mortgage-backed securities were reduced in value, if they started coming down in value. All right. So the rising home prices from 87 to 2006 kept the defaults very low because you could just sell your home. If you can't afford your home, you sell it, and then you make some profit and you pay the bank back. The house doesn't default. But um, as the lenders relaxed the standards so greatly, um, the house, and the housing prices started to fall, we had this recipe for a huge uh, bursting of this real estate bubble. And here is the actual bursting of the bubble where if we take a value index and... It doesn't quite work that way, but you can think of this as sort of like 50,000, and maybe houses got to an average rate of uh, 225,000, and then within a couple of years, they're back down about $100,000 on average. And just lately, they've been increasing as the bottom of the market was found, and home prices have stabilized, and now are increasing again. This is basically the, the run-up of the housing prices, and then the crash, as they got out of control. Because there was a frenzy. You know, you would just throw any money at real estate between 2002 to 2006, 
and you would make money anywhere. Just buy something, wait six months, sell it for twenty-five, fifty thousand dollars more. All right. So, and now the price of the bank stocks fell eighty-one percent between January two thousand and eight to March two thousand nine. The stock prices of the banking stocks all collapsed because everybody was in on this great scam. From the little banks to the bigger banks to the investment banks, they all um, plummeted during this financial crisis. And they've since rebounded, although they're having some problems right now, but nothing compared to the 2008. So the, the financial crisis spillover effect created this great recession, which was really terrible if you're graduating from college in 2009 or 2010 or 2011. So banks became under increasing um, financial pressure, leading to the reduction of loans. So they stopped loaning out as much money. So they pulled back greatly in the amount of loans they're going to make, which means that's sort of like an, an engine seizing with a lack of oil inside of it when the money dried up. So corporations couldn't raise a lot of money either because they started, they, they reviewed and, and slowed down the lending to corporations. So no expansions for corporations can hire new people, created unemployment uh, issues. Um, so businesses started hoarding their cash because they were afraid they couldn't borrow anything. They wanted to have enough cash to pay their bills. So that cut back on eco, uh, business activity and business construction and business capital spending which resulted in what we call the Great uh, Recession, which is something you live through and may affect you for the rest of your lives. Um, like the Great Depression uh, affected maybe your great-grandparents. Um, so the Glass-Steagall Act established the FDIC, which is one reason we didn't have a run on the banks. So when these banks were going bust, Nobody was really that worried because the federal government will step in and pay up to, at one point it was 250000 I think they since raised it to 500000 which they will, will back the bank so you don't have to worry about the bank closing and you losing your deposits, which was a big problem in the 30s. Um, it also pro prohibited institutions that took deposits from engaging activities, uh, securities, underwriting, and trading, there, thereby making the commercial banks safer because they couldn't really speculate like the investment banks. Now, the Graham-Leach-Bailey Act of 1999 reversed most of that and allowed uh, commercial investment banks and insurance companies to merge and create these huge entities, these huge banks that were the too big to fail banks. Uh, and then after the Great Recession, Dodd-Frank reform uh, created a Consumer uh, Protection Act in 2010 to help um, fill the gap between what was repealed in the glass Siegel Act and what was uh, was or was established in Glass Siegel but repealed in Graham Leach Bailey. The Dodd Frank Act was re new regulations that were put on to help prevent a similar financial crisis from occurring. Okay. Also in the 30s, they created the SEC Security Exchange Commission, which um, created a body, an agency to police stocks. Before the SEC was created, companies would just make up bullshit stocks with no business and no headquarters in a post office box and sell shares and never release any financial statements. And people would just say, oh, you know, buy the stock. It's a great stock. It's been going up. Okay, what's the company do? Who cares what the company does? It just keeps going up. Buy it. And it really was nothing. So the SEC came in and said, listen, you have to register with us. You have to provide financial statements. You have to disclose a, a bunch of information. And they helped to legitimize and protect individuals from stock market fraud. Okay, now we're moving into business taxes. And we're gonna, this is gonna be the subject of a big handout after the break. And the business taxes, it, it's similar to individual taxes, but different. So this is the new year, so you're gonna to have to prepare by April 16th or so, or 15th, you're gonna to have to prepare your federal taxes as an individual, maybe you, if you don't make any money, you don't have to prepare anything. But still, if you're in college as an undergraduate, you do get money from the government. So even if you're not working, you should probably file um, taxes because I think they do give certain amount of money to college students just for being in college and paying your college bills. It's like free money from the government. Okay, so businesses make income and they have to pay tax, just like you make income and have to pay tax. And, and tax is a real bummer, you know. Uh, I look at my paycheck, and for every dollar I make, I only see 50 cents in my paycheck. 
because it's not just taxes. Of course, you have your FICA, which is Social Security, and you have your Medicaid, and you have your state, and you have your federal, and you have your retirement funds, and you have your health insurance. All these things conspire together to steal up to 50% of your pay. So you expect to see, you know, maybe when you graduate, you'll make $10,000 a month, but you're only going to see $5,000 in your paycheck. So that's a bummer. But it's better than a lot of other countries, which are much higher. Especially a lot of European socialist countries, their taxes can be much, much higher. Okay. Um, so sole proprietorships and partnerships, the business income goes to the individual and they just pay their individual taxes. So those businesses, sole proprietorships and partnerships, they don't pay taxes as business entities. They pass the income through to the owners and they pay tax for their individual taxes. So it's really corporations that have their own separate tax brackets different than individuals. So, and there's two types of income that businesses and people can make, ordinary income and capital gain. So ordinary income is from business activity, you working or business selling a product. Capital gains is from an investment. You invest in something, the price of it increases, you sell it, the amount of money you made over what you purchased it is the capital gain, and that gets taxed differently. Uh, but these tax laws do change frequently, and tax brackets change, tax laws change, and we had, um, you know, we have new presidential um, elections coming up, and a lot of these candidates all have new tax plans. Uh, one guy wants to do a VAT, which basically get rid of the income tax and just put the tax on everything you buy, sort of like a supersized sales tax, which could be like 25% or 20% after state and federal. So imagine buying a $10 movie ticket, but now you're paying $12.50 when the VAT is added to it. So it's, it's sort of a, a different way of taxing. Um, but don't worry, every presidential election I've been through, the candidates have proved, have promised these tax plans, but never delivered. They had this one guy, the Pizza King, who ran for president four years ago, and he had a 999 plan, because that was like his pizza was $9.98. So he came up with a 999 tax plan. And that was like, I forgot what it was, 9% for individuals, 9% for corporations, and 9% for investments, I don't know. Something like that. But they all came up with these crazy tax plans. It sounds appealing because everybody feels like, I'm going to be saving money under this new tax plan. I want to vote for this guy. But then when they get in the office, they're like, what new tax plan? What are you talking about? Bring on the ladies. You know? <laughs> these presidents. These are the corporate tax rate schedule. So they break them up into different brackets from 0 to 50, 50 to 25. So they break your income up into what we call these um, range of in in taxable income or tax brackets. And each tax bracket has an assigned uh, marginal rate. So from the first $50,000 every business makes, they pay 15% on and then the next 25,000 they make, they pay 25%. Then the next 25,000 from 75 to 100,000, they pay 34%. So these tax brackets, think of them as like buckets. So once you fill up one bucket, a certain amount of tax you have to pay for that one bucket, the money moves on to the next bucket. And that bucket has its own separate tax percentage. And then when you fill up that with money, then you have to go to the third tax bracket or bucket and fill that up or and pay tax on that. So we break your income up into these different, put them into these different buckets, and each bucket has a different cost. And that's why it's kind of confusing. It's called a progressive tax system. So you don't pay one percentage on your income. You don't, your tax, if you say my tax rate is 39%, that's your marginal rate. But that's not the average rate you're paying because your money is going to be broken up into these different tax brackets for you to pay. And this is going to be the basis of our handout that we're going to go over in a minute. So here's an example of 250,000. If the, if a company earned 250,000, they'd have to break the tax up between um, various uh, tax brackets. We're going to go over this. I'm going to actually have you calculate this by hand, but rather than me reciting this formula here. Uh, and then the average, the marginal rate is the current bucket your money has left off in. The, the last bucket that you started to fill but haven't completely filled, that'd be your marginal rate, so whatever that bucket is. But your average rate is your total tax divided by your total income. 
So if you want an average tax rate, sometimes called blended, you look at the total taxes paid divided by your total income. And then average tax is, on average, what you pay for every dollar that you earn. So your marginal might be 39%, but on average, you only pay 32%, or 32 cents on each dollar. Um, dividends are, interest and dividends do affect the taxes of corporations. Uh, for corporations, 70% of all dividend income received um, so if a company invests in another company, so I'm a company, I'm going to lend money to another company, and they're going to pay me dividends, so maybe I buy preferred stock in another company, so one company is buying preferred stock from another company, and then they get paid dividends. Um, as long as you have less than 20% ownership, you only have to pay tax on 70% of all the dividends received, not 100%. You get a tax break and don't have to pay the full tax rate on all 100% of the dividends, just 70%. And corporations have this problem. They do this to try to mitigate the double taxation. Since companies pay tax and then they pass the money on to their owners and they pay tax, they gave this discount on dividends to help uh, moderate the double taxation that corporations pay. Uh, but unlike dividends, all interest income received is fully taxable. So if a company receives any interest income by lending money um, and then earning interest, that's fully taxable. Now, in, your, in the private taxes, in the, in the individual taxes, you have something called standard deduction or itemized deduction. So if you don't have a lot of deductions, you just take the standard deduction but if you have a lot of itemized deductions like mortgage interest, state tax, federal tax, uh, real estate tax, then you would take an itemized deduction. So for businesses, it works a little bit differently. They they don't necessarily have a standard deduction. They just want to, they have to add up all their business expenses. So in calculating the tax of the corporation, they have a lot more expenses that they can write off. For example, uh, a business can write off the interest on a credit card where an individual cannot write off the interest on the credit card. A business can write off the cost of an automobile bought through the company on their taxes, but an individual can't write off the cost of your automobile. A company can write off the cost of the gasoline to put in the automobile, but an individual can't. So companies have more tax advantages, more tax deductions to help lower their overall tax rate. That's why you're going to see these high tax rates for corporations, but then you hear all these stories where companies pay no tax. That's because they have all these great loopholes and tax deductions to help greatly reduce their overall tax payments. All right, so if a company, this is an example where if a company has interest expense, it reduces their earnings so they're not taxed on the full $2,000 of income, they're taxed on $170,000 of income because they get to reduce their interest expense, thereby lowering um, their total tax. So here's a company that has no debt and no interest. So they both make the same amount of money, 200000 One company has interest expense, one company doesn't. This interest expense will lower their, their earnings, which will lower their overall taxes. So this company will pay 80000 in taxes, while this company will only pay 68000 However, at the end, the net earnings after tax is usually higher for the company because you still they're still not paying the 30000 in interest. So even though they pay more taxes, by being a debt-free company, still have more earnings, but they don't have as, as big a earnings. Let's see. The company that took out the interest expense has more earnings than they otherwise would have if they didn't have that interest expense tax deduction. So it gives sort of an incentive, almost an incentive for companies to borrow money because the cost of borrowing that money is lowered when you have a, uh, a deduction on your interest rate. Let me give you a personal example. You take a mortgage out, and the interest on your mortgage is 4%. So you go to the bank and a mortgage for a house, and they charge you 4% on your mortgage. But you get to deduct that 4% off your taxes as a tax deduction. So maybe that 4% mortgage generates $8,000 of mortgage interest you pay a year. You get to deduct that from your taxes, so you really you get part of that back. So you're really only not paying $8,000 in mortgage interest. You're paying $6,000 after your tax deduction. So that lowers your mortgage costs from not 4%, but to 3% because of the tax deduction. 
making housing more affordable, one of the reasons that they allow deduction of mortgage interest. So that's how it personally could affect you, but companies have that same advantage for any type of interest. Okay. So the, so the cash flow is increased because of the use of debt to reduce the taxes helps to increase the cash flow. Now, for capital gains, if a company makes a capital gain, meaning they bought it, they made an investment, made some profits, and then those profits have to be taxed as part of their ordinary income. So it's just added to their income and they pay regular tax on it. For individuals, though, if you make a capital gain, you usually get a tax break. You'll pay lower than your marginal rate on that capital gain as an individual but not as a business. So that's a disadvantage of a business on their capital gains are taxed as regular income. All right. All right. That is the lecture. So let me end this.